You're listening to Art Affairs, episode 17. Today I'll be talking to Josh Thiessen. So my name is Michael Faith, and this is Art Affairs. If this is your first time listening, Art Affairs is meant to give you a look at and into the new contemporary art community, featuring conversations with artists, gallerists, curators, shining a spotlight on the human side of the wonderful work they do. You can dig through previous episodes, complete with show notes at artaffairspodcast.com, and you can check out new episodes on all your favorite podcast platforms. Of course, if you like what I'm doing here, be sure to subscribe, and you can always connect with the show on Instagram and Facebook at Art Affairs Podcast. All right, so today's guest is artist Josh Thiessen. You may have encountered Josh's work most recently with his Streams in the Wasteland series, which has ultimately spanned two solo exhibitions now. But Josh has actually been working at a professional level for over a decade, despite being the youngest guest I've had on. And interestingly, it all began back in Moscow. We talk about his time growing up in Russia on the show, as well as how he first got started showing in galleries at the age of 14, the difficulties his family has had from Lyme disease, and a whole lot more. So I hope you enjoy my conversation with Josh Thiessen. Josh, welcome to the show, man. It's it's really good to have you on. Yeah, thanks for having me. All right, so you are the uh, definitely the youngest person I've had on, um, but interestingly, you've actually had quite a few years under your belt as a professional artist, which, you know, we'll get into all of that, but but I want to really begin where it all began for you, which is in o- Moscow. Um, you were actually born in Moscow and spent the first six years of your life in Russia. Um, I believe your parents were working there as professors and, and doing humanitarian work. Um, what memories do you have of that time in Russia, and, and what was that experience like? Yeah, it was such a neat way to start my life as, you know, uh, what they call a third culture kid. And, um, you know, I was born in Moscow and and lived uh, in southern Russia and in Krasnodar for the first six years of my life. And I have, you know, fond memories of just like the rich um, culture of the arts that, that Russia has to offer. Um, I had a Russian nanny who did lots of arts and crafts with me from... Uh, I, the young age of three years old, she would hold up my stuffed animals, teaching me how to draw them with, you know, shading and perspective. And um, my parents, who uh, aren't artists, they um, began to quietly believe that I may have uh, a special gift for art, especially as my um, nanny noticed that. And uh, you know, we would go to uh, the, the ballet. Um, my my nanny's daughters were um, ballerinas. Uh, we would go to uh, the symphony. Um, the tickets were were much cheaper there, so <laughs> we could afford it. Um, but uh, I, it, what's what's interesting is that you know many Russians um, saw me, and even though I was uh, Canadian, my parents were were working there. Um, they said that I had a Russian soul. There was something about me that was. Um, kind of more contemplative and uh, yeah that was really um, how my life began and and do you still feel that connection to those Russian roots in in some way even now Um, yeah I do Uh, I used to be able to speak uh, fluent Russian but Mm. unfortunately I I lost that when I uh, returned home to to Canada I can still speak a little bit and um, later in life I've kind of gone back and read some of the you know Russian literary classics like uh, Tolstoy and Dostoevsky. Oh, I love those. Yeah, and definitely resonate with with them. Um, so yeah, I think it uh, yeah definitely made an impression on me. 
I, I went through, and it's probably around what your age is now. I went through a really heavy Russian literary phase where I was just gobbling up Dostoevsky and Tolstoy, and I was just like eating up all of those novels. Um, so, so I love that you're sort of into that as well. Um, you mentioned your Russian nanny. So, did she have, uh, I guess, a career in the arts, or was she an artist herself, or did she just recognize your artistic talent and try to cultivate that? Um, well, she was a uh, preschool teacher before, and so she was very good working with with children and just very creative lady, very smart lady. I believe she had a degree in engineering, um, but, uh, you know, she would spend like hours and hours with me, like three, four hours in the afternoon just working on, a, on an art project. And so, um, you know, my, my parents joke that, you know, she was actually even more keen on noticing <laughs> my abilities than, than they were. Very cool. Um, and so what led to them eventually leaving? Did their just, you know, their job end up moving back to, to uh, the States or, or I guess North America? Yeah, so uh, we returned home to Canada for my parents doing further education. Um, my dad completed his uh, PhD and my mom her uh, doctorate of ministry and leadership. And so we actually were going to uh, return and uh, uh, they were actually um, with my brother and I were going to go to Kazakhstan, but um, plans changed and my uh, dad was working um, at the, the national office of the organization um, that had sent my parents um, to Russia. And then actually, un unfortunately, just with the stressful uh, work situation, my parents fell ill and uh, they had um, contracted. Well, my dad first had contracted um, Lyme disease in, in Russia and our Russian guard dog had ticks in its fur. And so it lay dormant, um, but eventually just with the stressful situation of, of work uh, here in Canada, um, symptoms um, de developed and uh, eventually, you know, my, my mom also uh, fell ill and uh, years later, my, my brother and I had symptoms. So that kind of grounded uh, our family in Canada. Unfortunately, um, we weren't able to travel overseas um, anymore. Um, so yeah, it's, it's interesting how kind of circumstances can, can change so quickly because, you know, I'm not sure if my art would have developed if we had, um, travel back overseas, um, because, you know, uh, living here in, in Canada, um, which we'll, we'll get into, uh, eventually, but, uh, there are many opportunities that opened up for me, uh, with my art. And so it was kind of, um, surprising blessing in disguise. And, and so, you know, obviously nature plays a big part in your work, which we'll get into a little bit later, but would you, were you exposed much to nature as a kid uh, there in Canada? Uh, yeah, I, I definitely was. And, um, you know, we, we lived on a, a property that had, you know, rolling hills and um, forests nearby. Kind of the area where we live is called the Niagara Horseshoe. So it's close to Niagara Falls and uh, there's lots of hiking trails. So uh, yeah, that definitely made an impression on me. And I, I think um, also what was a big influence is my, my grandparents and specifically my, my grandpa was a big fan of Robert Bateman, who's this uh, you know, well-known wildlife artist. And um, he would have his coffee table books at uh, their place. And so I would flip through those from a young age. So um, yeah, I would definitely say I had an affinity for uh, the outdoors for animals very early on. Well, and, and you mentioned Robert Bateman, and I'm glad you did. Um, you know, you've had several influential artistic people in your early life, um, you know, from the Russian nanny um, to a lady named Valerie Jones to Robert Bateman himself, who you mentored under. Um, what do you feel that their individual contributions were to your having such an early success? Yeah, yeah. You mentioned um, Valerie Jones. She, um, when uh, I kind of alluded to the fact that being granted in Canada um, kind of changed the course of my life, when I was um, nine years old, um, she discovered me at a church children's club just drawing a name tag. And she noticed I had a artistic ability and she invited me over to her studio, um, an old a British lady um, retired and she was a um, wildlife and pet portrait artist and she specialized in uh, chalk pastel. So um, from, from that point, 
you know, art had just been kind of uh, a hobby, um, or at least I was, you know, creatively inclined, um, didn't do a lot of it in school. But at that point, um, my parents um, started homeschooling my, my brother and I. And so I had more time to, to develop uh, my work. And so this lady, um, Val, um, you know, invited me over to her studio. And so I think her love of wildlife rubbed off on me, definitely. Um, and uh, she really encouraged me. I naturally started in, in chalk pastel. And um, then she booked me for my first exhibition when I was 11 years old, which my parents thought she was crazy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they would have never thought to do that. Yeah, so 11 years old, which, I mean, first of all, that makes me feel super old um, that, that you're having exhibitions at 11. Um, so how did that come about? And, and how did, you know, what led to you guys end up putting that exhibition together? Uh, well, it was at a uh, local hospital that had like an art gallery at it. And so, um, you know, Val helped us set, it, set up the work. I was also doing some photography and graphic design, but then um, I had my uh, chalk pastel pieces. And it's just incredible that like, you know, the press came out um, to interview me and, um, you know, the first strangers started purchasing my work. I mean, I had given away a lot of my my early pieces to friends and family. And um, it was at that point that someone started, uh, someone asked me to do my first commission piece of a, a tufted titmouse bird. And so, um, yeah, it, it that's where, where it began. And then, you know, of course, people um, knowing uh, Robert Bateman here in Canada, um, you know, they said to me that, you know, you should really, you know, write him a, a letter and, and let him know about your work. And so I'm kind of fa fast forwarding uh, a few years now, but um, I, I wrote him a letter when I was uh, 14 years old and sent him some of my wildlife um paintings um, as, you know, uh, print offs and then received a, an email and then was able to get mentored by him. So it was kind of like one thing sort of uh, snowballed, uh, uh, kind of developed from the other. Yeah, for sure. And, and so was it that first exhibition um, in 2006 that uh, where you where your interest in art sort of changed from a hobby or something that you just did as as an activity to a career or something that you actually wanted to pursue seriously? I, I think at that point it was still uh, more like a hobby because like in my preteen years, uh, I was really into basketball as well. <laughs> um, I mean, I wanted to go to the NBA and I was just super dedicated. I mean, Steve Nash was my hero. And <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, Dallas, there you <laughs> but, go. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, like chances of a short white kid from Canada making the NBA were, were pretty slim. So <laughs> um, I'm glad I kind of transitioned more to art. Um, I think really at the point where I thought, you know, this could be um, a career was when like I had my first kind of public gallery exhibition when I was 14 at uh, the Art Gallery of Burlington, um, a city next door to Toronto. And then being mentored under Robert Bateman, who also encouraged me, you know, uh, this could be a career, but you have to accept help from from others. And that's when my uh, mom, who uh, accompanied me um, out to uh, BC, she uh, uh, was told by by Bateman, you know, you also need to, you know, really support him. And um, I think that was the moment that I thought, you know, maybe this could be something more than just a hobby. Mm. And so having getting started so young, um, you obviously didn't go to like art school or any kind of formal art education at like a higher learning institution. So were you mostly self-taught or were it, was it the experience you had under people like Robert Bateman or some of the mentors that, that were in your life that were your art education? Yeah, I would say it was pro primarily self-taught. I did do a year-long mentorship project under the head art professor of a prominent university um, in my city, and that was um, very influential. And so my art education has been more non-formal. I traveled throughout Europe and studied in art museums, uh, copying from the masters. And I, you know, did get my portfolio reviewed by some of the top art schools. And I, you know, got great reviews and would have been accepted to go to all of them and um, potentially scholarships as well. But unfortunately, they all made it clear that they would have to deconstruct my style and that I, I wouldn't be able to do realism 
um, you know, animal art that was just so frowned upon. And really, (laughs) yeah. Um, So that, you know, that was, you know, the the advice that that Bateman uh, gave me was that uh, he didn't go the art school uh, route either. But, um, you know, just to paint your little heart out, (laughs) that was his advice to me. Is there ever, do you ever feel like there's just something missing from not having that experience at art school? Even though, yeah, I agree. I think that's drastic to have to completely reconstruct your style. But are there aspects of art school that you feel like you missed out on? I, I, I wouldn't say so because I'm pretty self-directed and, and like to challenge myself with the new styles of art. Uh, anyhow, like uh, throughout my teens, I tried abstract and expressionism and photography and um, you know, graphic design. And so I did try to expose myself to a lot of um, styles of work. And um, like I mentioned earlier, this uh, professor, um, master artist Judy Major Girardin from McMaster University, she kind of provided me what, what was similar to an art school um, experience with like critiques and, um, you know, development and, and books that um, students would have read. Uh, so, yeah, maybe maybe I did miss out on, you know, the social aspect um, that, you know, an art school would would bring about. But um, yeah, I just my my education kind of took a, a different direction. And so um, being self motivated, I think, really helped um, in kind of pushing myself. Yeah, that's that's great. Um, and, and so I you know, not only did you get an early start in your career, but you were actually identified as a pro- an actual prodigy. Like, <laughs> you know, and so I want to talk to you a little bit about your status as a quote unquote prodigy. Um, how does all that work? Like, is that something that you and your parents like reached out to people to validate? Like, your parents recognized your talents, or how how was explain that process to me and what was all involved in that? Yeah, definitely. I haven't had kind of the stage mom sort of <laughs> parents uh, <laughs> at all. Um, no, it was a kind of um, strange uh, turn of events. So I wasn't even discovered as a prodigy when I was um, very young. It was kind of retroactive. Um, so basically, um, my work got picked up by this article in the Huffington Post called 10 Art Prodigies You Should Know. And from, from, from which, and then it was funny because they never even notified me that I was in it. It was my dad's cousin that <laughs> let me know. About it. Um, and then a uh, psychology professor, who's a prodigy expert from Ohio State University, she um, contacted my parents. Um, she phoned them and said, "You know, I, I I've uh, seen your your child's art, and um, I'm conducting a study of 30 prodigies around the world in all different fields, and I'd like to to study him." And uh, she also wanted to study uh, a close sibling, and so when she uh, uh, saw my brother's you know musical work, um, she also believed that he was a prodigy as well. And some people are kind of vague on what is a prodigy. They don't always know. Um, but her kind of technical uh, definition is that it's a, you know, uh, a child or an adolescent who's producing um, work at an advanced adult level, um, but is also creating an original body of work. And in, in her research, um, she was uh, trying to figure out if there was a connection to autism. And she, she actually found that often, you know, a first cousin had autism. Um, my, br- my brother and I, uh, we, we don't have autism and uh, to our knowledge, don't have relatives who, who have autism either. Um, we score higher on the, the quotient. But she um, discovered sort of in our history, my brother and I both had severe head injuries. And so uh, she theorized um, like uh, there have been other cases of people who had head injuries and that, um, you know, the right brain overcompensated the right side of the brain. And so the um, uh, abilities developed and she took our DNA as well. Um, it was crazy. She drove up through a blizzard to get here to Canada <laughs> um, just shortly after uh, she had phoned my, my parents and um, our DNA was uh, studied by uh, some of the top researchers at, at McGill University. 
and uh, the other prodigies as well. And uh, they actually were able to identify uh, a gene that we all shared in common. Interesting. So is that like an ongoing study that they're still trying to figure out like what that commonality is? Um, yeah, and, it, and it's a commonality with autism. So like the extreme focus and obsessiveness, um, but not uh, the social deficits. And so it's kind of neat because actually um, all this research was written up in a book called The Prodigy's Cousin, uh, which was uh, published by Pagan Random House. And um, my brother and my story is in a chapter of it. But um, she explains in the book how understanding the brain of prodigies could potentially um, help those with autism, um, but also help to understand people with Alzheimer's and dementia. Because if you can kind of stimulate one side of the brain to kind of wake up another side of the brain, um, it, it's uh, there's could be you know potential for for various treatments. So it's uh, yeah, pretty interesting area of research, and you know we're happy to you know contribute to science in in some way. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, you know I don't. Uh, go around telling people, oh, I'm a prodigy. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I was going to ask you, like, what, what your feeling is about that label in general? Like, how, how do you feel about it? Yeah, I think um, it could be seen as sort of pretentious and or, or kind of a gimmick in the, in the art world. Um, but like, for, for me, I've never kind of made my way um, showing with with galleries or getting in magazines just on the fact that I'm a prodigy. Like, I've been in an adult world for, for, you know, most of my life with, with my art and my art was um, evaluated just on the merits of the art itself and, and not my age, which I, I think is a really good thing because now that uh, I, I'm 24 and, you know, a, a bit older, um, I, I don't, you know, need to use the prodigy thing to kind of like, uh, you know, uh, help my, my career or any way, like I, I'm an adult now and, and I hope people, um, just look at, at the work itself. So, um, but it's, yeah, it was still, uh, uh, cool to be recognized though. Yeah, no, and I'm glad you mentioned that because yeah, at some point, you know, people's work has to speak for itself and, and, you know, and, mm -hmm. and it, it's, it's good that you, you really kind of recognize that and that resonates with you. Um, you know, cause a lot of the, the difficulty that a lot of folks have who found success at a very young age is turning that into a long lasting career, you know, like child movie stars or, yeah, exactly. you know, quiz kid, Donnie Smith, you know, just, you know, turning what was early success into something that lasts a long time. Um, and, and you not only got started, so I want to talk a little bit about that, just how you started your career, the career side of things, but then also have since continued to develop that and help that to grow. Um, so you mentioned that first gallery exhibition at 14. Um, you know, how did you first start getting galleries to notice your work and, and get your work into a gallery? I think it was, you know, initially like the, the art gallery of Burlington uh, was my first kind of public gallery show. I, you know, uh, there was an application process and I was able to get uh, accepted. And, you know, over the, the years, you know, I applied to some local um, art auctions. And when I was uh, 17 years old, um, the National Gallery in Canada, which is located in our capital in Ottawa, um, they were uh, hosting a competition for young artists, um, teenagers. And so, you know, I submitted my work and it was a, a voting competition and uh, got my whole, you know, high school to, to vote for me and friends and family. And, um, you know, it was fortunate to get the second highest votes and um, be part of a group exhibition um, in the National Gallery. And I think also, like, the, the media also picked up on things. Um, so that that was one of the things that, um, you know, national media picked up on. And then um, I also um, got involved with uh, some artist guilds uh, that were based in the in the US. And so that was how I kind of broke into um, the the US. So uh, initially, I was juried in, I maybe when I was 15, 16 years old into the International Guild of Realism. And so they have uh, juried exhibitions every year in um, galleries throughout the US and showed at uh, 
Robert Lang Studios in Charleston and Principal Gallery in Alexandria and some of these historic uh, cities that really have a high appreciation for realism. And so I've been doing a lot of um, wildlife and naturally based work up to that point um, and more kind of literal de depictions. But then once I got into the International Guild of Realism, my, my work kind of developed and I started painting kind of old abandoned architecture and peeling paint. And so I felt a bit more free um, to, to explore um, subject wise. And then uh, from there, um, you know, I would get to know, I would travel down for the show and they would um, give out awards. And I, I was very fortunate to re receive uh, awards with <laughs> competing against artists double to triple my age. <laughs> but it was uh, a great way to kind of um, meet also uh, like the head editor of American Art Collector magazine, Joshua Rose, who's a, a friend of mine. Um, and then kind of, you know, one thing kind of, spun off of the other and uh, I was able to um, start showing my work more more in the US. Before you turned, you know, 18, 19, 20, um, did you ever have any galleries uh, resist or express any kind of resistance because of your age? Yeah, I, I think uh, for, for sure. And people don't always think about that. Like the general public think, oh, it's great that you're young. I'm sure galleries would love that. But uh, there is a, a hesitancy, I think. Um, and of, of galleries taking me on like uh, unfortunately like in um you know my the city uh near where i'm from uh hamilton and also toronto um i i did show in some um you know our art fairs in toronto but really no prominent galleries kind of picked up on on my work there and um some kind of uh lower end galleries did but they just weren't the the right fit and so I've just kind of gone where my work has been accepted. And, uh, you know, even though galleries uh, here in, in Canada have not necessarily picked up on my work, I, I have had a lot, like most of my art collectors have been from um, Canada and I established my own uh, studio gallery in 2010 and um, put my own exhibitions on uh, open houses every December. And that was able, that was how I was able to, um, you know, uh, sell my work and then kind of uh, uh, was a kind of um, helped me then go and have, you know, enough money to go to the US to show in galleries. And then, you know, now it's, um, you know, primarily American galleries that are contacting me uh, to show the work and the whole new contemporary movement, uh, which I know you're, you're a part of has, uh, definitely taken a real interest in my work and, uh, you know, John, Jonathan Levine projects kind of introduced me um, to to that whole world. And so, uh, like I said, you know, I've just um, gone where my work has been appreciated. Yeah. So you mentioned Jonathan Levine and and, and I wanted to, to dive into that because that was, you know, a few years ago, 2017, I guess he was holding this competition of sorts. You know, I think he called it the delusional uh, Jonathan Levine search for the next great, great artist or something like that. Right. Um, and, and you actually placed first in that competition, which is what ultimately got you a solo show a couple years later. Um, what was that competition process like? Did you just submit a piece to, to be considered and then it was voted on? Like what, what did that all involve? Uh, yeah. So it was kind of a funny uh, story. So like I found out about the competition, like three days before it was uh, closing. <laughs> for applications and I was down in Florida and you know uh I'm like you know hey why why not I'll, I'll submit my work um and so I s submitted three three pieces um not you know of course not thinking about the fact that those paintings uh were were back home in Canada so how are we going to ship them to the gallery if I got accepted but then um sure enough I I got a email back saying that I was a finalist initially and so there are 42 finalists and then um my my dad uh i mean bless his heart he was uh, able to help me figure out um the the shipping situation of how to get uh, the three paintings that were um accepted for for the show down to the the gallery which had then uh relocated to to jersey city and so uh i was uh, fortunate to be able to uh, travel for the show and 
um, see all the the other artists work. And I think even before um, Jonathan had met me, so this was the afternoon of the uh, opening reception of the finalist exhibition, I was standing in the Museum of Modern Art and I get a phone call from my mom and she's like, Josh, you need to look at your, your email. Um, there, there's a, a, a neat email that's just come in. And so I, I got the news that uh, indeed I had come first for the whole exhibition, um, the whole competition rather. And uh, yeah, I was just you know blown away. Um, just the fact that I don't know, I don't think Jonathan even uh, knew, knew my age. Um, I think I was 21, 22. Um, yeah, and so uh, that was you know a, a, a huge honor. Um, Kind of, I walked into the exhibition and my my large painting of Occidental Babylon with these hyenas in this ghost town, uh, which is this, a great big painting that took me eight months to complete. It was, you know, hanging right up there, prominent. Um, and yeah, I was just, you know, super grateful. And uh, then to be mentored uh, under Jonathan for until my my solo exhibition. Yeah. So um, let's talk about the solo exhibition. So that the the I guess winning that competition ultimately gave you a solo exhibition a couple of years later in 2019, which is like a year ago. Yeah. Um, yeah. Last, last May. Yeah. Yeah. And so how did that show come together? Was that, was that the idea for that show something that you already had been working on and you pitched to him or did you guys kind of work together to collaborate on the theme? How did that come together? Yeah. So I had actually been already working on a series since 2015 called Streams in the Wasteland. And so it was um, a new body of work that was kind of more um, imaginative, putting animals in unusual environments, uh, old abandoned towns, that sort of thing. And so it just kind of um, naturally worked out that I uh, told Jonathan, you know, I was working on these paintings already. And because my paintings take so long, um, I, I needed, you know, the, the time um, in order to be able to uh, create this body of work. And so, um, yeah, it, 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 it worked out. I was able to um, just, you know, put on the exhibition exactly how I wanted it and how I envisioned. Jonathan um, is a really, uh, a really flexible gallery owner. He really wants the artist's work um, to be the best possible. So he doesn't put kind of creative limits um, like some gallery owners. So I really appreciated that um, because I was able to have like a time-lapse video going of the creation of one of the paintings and then also the uh, artist statements that I write that accompany the paintings to hang in the show. And so, um, yeah, it was uh, yeah it's a, a really big honor. Um, and it was, you know, technically like my debut international solo exhibition um, outside of Canada. Yeah, so, so that the streams in the wasteland, um, like like you mentioned, it involves a lot of times animals sort of reclaiming the environment, which I have to say is rather timely. Um, <laughs> um, but uh, how did that series first start? Was that an idea that you had for like one painting, and then it sort of blossomed into a full series, or did you conceive the whole thing as a series from the beginning? It was the first time that I had actually done a, a painting series, really. So. Um, but I, I, I didn't have all the paintings uh, envisioned at, at one point, um, but just uh, a, a little bit of like the, the background behind it. Um, I read a lot and I get lots of inspiration um, from that. And so I, I was reading through uh, the biblical book of Isaiah and there are these um, kind of imaginative depictions of animals taking over, you know, um, civilizations. And so it, it's kind of a sign of, you know, humanity's lack of uh, faithfulness to the creator and then to the natural world um, and how these animals are then kind of taking over these strongholds. Um, and so I was thinking, you know, wouldn't it be interesting to kind of apply that um, for a, a modern application where, you know, animal and rights and environmentalism is important. And that had already been uh, a theme in my work about uh, conservation and just uh, the beauty and, and wonder of the natural world. And so uh, eventually just these um, ideas kind of started coming out of me and I would, um, you know, read a, a portion, um, a passage, and then, you know, 
creatively and interpret it. I started with an owl in an old uh, Gothic cathedral and then a, a, a whale um, and then a, a wolf and an old minaret. And um, I, I also like old historical architecture as well. And I wanted to kind of um, represent, you know, uh, civilizations um, across vast periods of time. So w when did it dawn on you that, hey, this is actually like a full series, like this isn't just an idea for a piece, this is actually something bigger? Uh, I think when I just kept having new ideas uh, <laughs> for, for paintings, and it, it just, uh, uh, the series went an end, and I just kept going and kept going, and um, just, yeah, I was really having a lot of fun with it. And I think also what was kind of unique was, like at the same time, I was also experimenting with non-rectangular shapes um, as, as well, and um, just trying to uh, find my own voice um, because, you know, I didn't want to be pigeonholed as sort of like a naturalistic wildlife artist. I wanted to, um, you know, incorporate kind of like symbolism and like uh, philosophy uh, in my work. And so, um, yeah, I just kept going with, with the series and, it kind of uh, developed into a part two after my exhibition at, at Jonathan Levine. Um, part two of Streams in the Wasteland was held at Corey Helford Gallery, uh, which was uh, December um, to January of this year. And then uh, even now I'm, I'm working on, on one last painting in the series. Yeah, so you posted um, some, some shots about the, the progress on your Instagram, and this is the final piece of the series, right? This, this big, big uh, triptych that you're working on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so it, it was a painting that I've had planned for several years now, and I, I knew it was going to be a large painting, and it was going to kind of tie up all these vignettes of uh, animals um, and bring them all together. And so... Um, it, it, the painting initially was going to be one size and then kind of blossomed into a triptych. <laughs> and I then thought, well, I'm in quarantine now, might as well, you know, I have, have the time to, to go big with a, a painting. And so, um, yeah, it's the largest I've, I've ever worked. It's five feet by nine feet. Combined, the three pieces combined? Yeah, yeah, all together. Are you enjoying working at this larger scale? Uh, yeah, yeah, I do enjoy um, working at the scale. It's just obviously a bit more challenging um, and having, um, you know, architectural elements too, like just getting the, the perspective right. Uh, for, for this one, um, like I spent more time than usual doing the, the prep work. So usually like with each painting, I use my own uh, photo references and um, sketches. And uh, that took a long time because I think there are uh, 17 animals all, all together in the piece. And uh, I decided that uh, it would be helpful to learn 3D modeling uh, in, in my spare time. Wow. <laughs> I had a friend who kind of gave me a crash course and um, through, through Zoom. <laughs> and basically, I created a 3D model in order to figure out how all the animals would be in scale to one another. Um, Cause there's some whales and whales are, you know, quite sizable um, and how, how uh, they would scale in proportion to like a wolf, for instance, or an elephant. And so, yeah, then, you know, compiling all the photo references. So yeah, I've been, it's, it's felt weird, not, not painting actually, but being kind of more on, on the computer in, in the sketchbooks, but um, I, I really wanted to make sure it was uh, right before I began. Does this new piece have a title or are you keeping that under wraps? Uh, yeah, yeah. It's titled uh, Agnes Day. Okay. And is this, uh, how many does that make total for the series? Um, it will, I think in total it will be 17. Okay. Yes. Yes. So. Do you have a new series planned? I mean, it must feel, I guess, kind of good, but then also kind of like, oh man, I miss it, you know? <laughs> yeah, I actually do have a new series planned. And so um, I I feel like now more than ever, I'm thinking in, in series of bodies of work and not necessarily like um, for exhibitions, like solo exhibitions because I'm okay if work kind of spills over to different shows. Um, but uh, yeah, I have a, a future series that um, 
I've already completed one piece for, uh, which will be at a group show uh, at Ray's Contemporary in, in Manhattan in the fall. And this series um, will incorporate two kind of mystical figures. And I normally don't paint people, um, but they'll be kind of more silhouetted, but then there'll also be animals. And um, I'm really interested in kind of medievalism and, um, you know, incorporating that with kind of contemporary formats of uh, the painting panel and shapes and sort of um, juxtaposing that. Uh, and, and also like a slightly different color palette. Um, mm. I'm kind of looking at the whole series as, um, you know, the, there's one figure that kind of um, represents more kind of like uh, kind of mystery and um, questioning of life. And then the other figure, um, the female, she represents kind of life and um, the greening uh, effect that Hildegard of Bingen talked about, um, the concept of ariditas. And so I'm going to kind of contrast both of these things and um, the other figure, which will represent uh, a vanitas, um, which is, you know, an art historical uh, term, and um, will also kind of incorporate kind of science as well. Um, so I have all these ideas sort of like floating around in my mind, um, but it'll still be very, you know, naturally based and, um, you know, looking to uh, nature for, for answers and um, the way forward. So, so with, with nature being such a big uh, part of your work up until now, how do you stay connected to nature now that you're like a working adult? Are you still able to go out and, and make time to enjoy the outdoors? Yeah, I try, I try my best. Obviously, in the last couple of months, it's been uh, a little bit different than, than usual. A lot of our parks are, are closed down and um, just for everyone's safety, uh, of course. But yeah, I, I um, live very close to Lake Ontario. It's just a, a couple of kilometers down the street. And so that's a uh, great place to unwind. And uh, I'm also just like here uh, in, in my studio outside my windows, I get tons of birds. I have bird feeders and I have rabbits that, that visit my backyard and obviously squirrels. And um, so I'm, yeah, really surrounded by uh, a natural environment. I have the, the Niagara Escarpment close by, um, you know, also, one thing that, that I have been involved in is that I'm on the board of a conservation area um, close to where I live. And uh, that's something that I've been able to, you know, uh, financially support over the years um, and even, you know, do a painting uh, for them that, that raised funds to protect the land. Uh, it has some really interesting geological um uh, elements. Uh, and so, yeah, I, I, yeah, I do try my, my best, but I do need to, to get uh, outdoors because I, I do spend a lot of time inside <laughs> painting every day. <laughs> no, for sure. And, and I, I do want to talk a little bit more about your process. Um, so, so, you know, most of the work that you do, especially in recent years, has been oil on wood panel, um, on birch panel specifically. Mm -hmm. um, but o in the past, you have also worked in acrylic. Uh, and do you still use acrylic to this day or have you completely shifted to oils? Yeah, I do actually use acrylic for just the underpainting. And so um, I really uh, like that process because um, I can still, you know, develop or change the composition in acrylics much more faster than, than oils. And so um, I, I uh, sketch out the whole composition in charcoal and then seal it. And um, my primer is actually a 50% gray ground, uh, which I think really helps um, rather than just starting on a white ground. And then um, I uh, lay down the acrylic paint um, very transparently so I can even see some of the charcoal underneath later for the, the oil paint. And even then I'm um, trying to solidify the color palette. I've pretty much had it figured out, but um, I'm able to uh, adjust that. And then um, after the acrylic painting, I'll, I'll transition to the oils. What led to that initial shift from acrylic being the primary medium to oil being the primary medium? Yeah, well, um, backing up, I switched from pastel to acrylic so I could go larger and I didn't have to glass my work. 
and then I switched from acrylics to oils. I was maybe partially influenced by um, some of these artists in the International Guild of Realism who are just incredible masters. I, I saw what they could achieve in just, um, you know, smooth gradations. And you, you could do that to some extent in acrylics. I just found it was a lot more stressful. <laughs> like I, you can use sponges and foam and, and um, uh, dry brushing, that sort of thing. But with oils, I felt you actually had more control which um, may be counterintuitive for some people because it's so slow drying. But I initially started with alkyd oils, um, which I like to an extent because they're faster drying. Um, but then I just switched to like traditional oils. Um, and, you know, I, I paint so thin that they hardly take any time to, to dry within a day or two, um, which gives me enough time to blend, um, but also you know, the richness of, of color that you can really um, get in, in oils. And then, um, yeah, I, I like, uh, yeah, I, and I really, I really do like painting in oils now for, for the top coats. Are there other mediums that you'd like to explore or become a proficient in other than 3D modeling? <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, I don't know if 3D modeling will uh, flourish into sculpting, but <laughs> it, it was fun. Um, just kind of foraying into that area, but I, I have a lot of uh, respect for, you know, animators and, and all that is involved in that. But yeah, I think at this point I'm fairly settled with, with oil painting. Um, I, I want to keep experimenting just with the, the format. Um, many years ago, like I alluded earlier, I broke away from rectangles and squares because I just felt that a lot of subject matter wasn't conducive and I wanted to let uh, the painting itself to, to dictate that. And, you know, there have been, um, you know, various abstract color field painters um, like Ellsworth Kelly and uh, Kenneth Noland and Elizabeth Murray uh, who have done these, you know, shape pieces. And I thought, you know, it'd be interesting as a hyper-realist painter um, to kind of uh, merge that with a very kind of contemporary thing. Uh, so that's that's where I'm still um, wanting to experiment. Um, also just with the, the framing too, um, I've been able to design some altarpiece frames uh, with, you know, opening and closing doors on them. And I think that's been fun because uh, I'm thinking about like, not just wanting to create something that only translates to a digital platform like like Instagram, um, which it which don't get me wrong is great, but what can um, oil painting do that maybe digital painting can't do? And it's really about the physical object and experiencing it, it in space, and then kind of continuing the the long history of you know the Renaissance, for for instance, that had these tabernacle frames. And so uh, that's kind of the area that I'm exploring now. Um, fortunately, I, I have assistants that can build the frames and do the, the antiquing. And um, but uh, yeah, that's that's something that that's on my mind lately. How did the uh, the custom shaped wood panels first come about? When did you first get the idea for that? And, and you know, did it start with just, again, one piece or did, did it, is it something that you just really wanted to incorporate into your work as a whole? Yeah, so I believe it started with a circular painting, um, a hoy sleeper. It's of this uh, deep sea diver. And I like the circular helmet. And I was thinking, you know, a rectangle wouldn't really reflect that. I like kind of the timelessness of a circle. Uh, you don't have any kind of point of, of beginning or end. And so, um, you know, artists have been painting on circles uh, since the Renaissance, the Tondo frame would be an example of that. And so uh, I, I find those like collectors who maybe aren't as um, comfortable like with, with non-rectangular pieces, at least like a circle, circular painting is like yeah. <laughs> kind of an easier inroads to that. Um, and then I, I tried, you know, another like a triptych circular painting, um, Time is My Oyster with a pocket watch. And, and then, yeah, I just continued from, from there. And I, I didn't want the, the shapes to be jarring at all, like to someone, for someone to come up uh, looking at my painting and think, oh, wow, that like, oh, that's a, that's a weird shape or like not, not look at the painting itself. Um, and I also like, I was already painting around the sides uh, of the painting. 
Um, so like, you know, how like on a gallery canvas, is, it has the two inch uh, edges. And so um, I was wrapping the painting around the sides. So then, you know, painting on shape panels worked out well. Well, because that, that is sort of a balance. Like you mentioned, the, the balance of trying not to be distracting with the shape, um, but then also having the shape sort of complement the piece itself. Because, you know, a lot of times when, when people go to frame shops or do a lot of framing, um, they'll have these really garish frames that distract you from the artwork, mm -hmm. right? Um, so how do you, I guess, how do you decide on what the shape will be and at what part in your process do you typically figure that shape out? Uh, because it must be pretty early uh, so that you can build the compositions around it, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Um, it's usually in my uh, sketchbook that I have on my night side table and it's a little five by seven inch and I sketch the composition and usually on the back page, I just kind of like imagine some shapes that would kind of fit the subject matter. And so, yeah, it comes pretty early because then like when I'm working on Photoshop to create the composite, I, I then kind of make a more accurate shape that then um, gets cut out, um, you know, accurately to that. So, uh, yeah, and it's something that, that can't be forced. It has to has to really feel natural. And, and do you shape the panels yourself or do you have people that are capable in woodworking that do that do it for you? How, how does that work? Uh, yeah, actually. Um, yeah, I have a, a assistant, my dad, uh, he's very good at woodworking and um, builds them. I buy the tools and materials and, and he, he builds them. And so, yeah, yeah, I'm really, really fortunate to, to have that um, flexibility to be able to do that. And because these are so immersive and because there is that immersive element to them, does it make it difficult to translate those to like prints? Like if you want to make prints for these pieces, does that does that become a challenge? Yeah, yeah, it can be a challenge for sure. Um, yeah, I've done several print series uh, over the years um, and the earlier, you know, rectangular pieces that I did translated um, probably better, but I actually found a way that um, I can do the shape and I have a uh, contact in Toronto that does um, custom matting shapes. So you can actually like turn the rectangular print, which has like a shape piece, and then you put a matting on it that's also shaped. And so, um, yeah, that that's worked out well. And people can also have, like I have, uh, I've I, I've uh, contact that make shaped frames too, so that's also uh, an option for people. Okay, very cool. Um, and you mentioned earlier that you do a lot of uh, reference photography, um, and you, you you like to use a lot of your own uh, photos for references. Um, how does that that usually work? Do you normally um, have an idea in mind at first, and you're trying to go out and take photos that specific of very specific things, or does it start with a, like a photography outing that sparks your creativity? I think initially it was more me taking photos and then looking through my uh, references later in, on my computer. And, and it still is to some extent. Um, I kind of have to jog my memory and remind myself, oh, yeah, I, you know, I took photos of snow then or, or um, whatever it may be. But generally now I, I do travel uh, in order to get references or, for, for instance, like, when I was out at the LA art show uh, a couple of years ago um, and, and had my work at, at the fair, like I would do side trips and, um, you know, road trip and, and uh, go out to like old um, ghost towns like uh, Bodie um, or when I had a show in uh, Denver at, at Gallery 1261, I went to St. Elmo, Colorado, which is like three hours away from Denver, uh, old mining town. So. And sometimes I go to zoos as well um, to, to get uh, photos of specific animals. So it, yeah, it, it varies really from painting to painting. But are, are, I guess when you're going out on these outings, are you looking for very specific shots? Yeah, yeah. generally now I, I am. Um, trying to think like, yeah, like recently, like for my, my next series, um, like I had to coordinate models and um, their, their outfits and uh, props. So it's become more intentional over the years. 
and and once you have you know a good amount of reference photos and you're happy with uh, you know uh, that aspect of it and the research effectively done, how do you typically work out your compositions? You mentioned that you do some of it digitally, um, and and is it a combination of uh, just physical sketching and digital composition? Uh, yeah, and one thing I I also just uh, uh, forgot to mention uh, with with the photo references, um, like I have my own. Uh, strobe lights. So um, I'm able to then kind of manipulate the light um, beforehand on on subject matter when I can, because um, that's really important in, you know, even making the, the composite is the direction of light, um, because light's really important in my work. Um, and then, uh, like, I... Uh, at, at one point thought I was going to go into, you know, graphic design. And, um, you know, I did a year doing corporate graphic design work after high school and t taken some college courses in like uh, Illustrator and Design Photoshop, those programs. So I, I had those skills already. And I thought like before knowing that, you know, many artists create Photoshop mock uh, composites, I thought, you know, maybe I can use some of these skills that I have in, in Photoshop um, to kind of create a, a basic um, mock-up. Uh, it's nothing overly refined. Um, Actually, I have a video on my YouTube channel that that kind of illustrates the whole process for Occidental Babylon, the making of, and that shows actually how I create the composite in Photoshop. Um, but yeah, it, it's it, it's like I said, rough. But then also, I'm able to create the whole like color scheme for the painting, um, and I take my uh, concept sketch as well, and then. Um, scan it into the computer and then digitally paint it so that I can try different color palettes out. Okay. And, and do you typically work at uh, multiple pieces at once? I, I know a lot of oil painters tend to do that because the, the paint dries so slowly, but do you tend to work on several pieces at the same time or just one at a time? I actually just work on one at a time, actually. Okay. And uh, that's just um, fit my personality. Um, my brother is a musician. He loves working on multiple uh, songs and compositions at the same time. But for, for me, like, uh, I, I think because I also like premix all my paints. And so I have them all set aside for that painting. And so um, makes it more efficient to work on one. And also, uh, I, I have to, it helps me to push myself. Like if I um, get to a roadblock in the creative process, um, I, I usually don't just walk away from the painting. I, I usually just keep working at it and eventually I, I figure it out. And um, yeah, I, I like to just ha have all my energies just, just focused on one, but, but I, I still work on other paintings like more at the conceptual level while I'm, I'm painting. So like, I will be sketching paintings out uh, three, four, five years in advance in my sketchbooks. Okay. Um, and, and I guess because you did say that you paint uh, in pretty thin layers, it, it probably doesn't take that long to dry. So it's not limiting you in that way? Um, no, no. Yeah, I, I use um, walnut oil and, um, you know, traditional oil paints and you know, I can move around. I also have like a mall stick on on my easel that um, was like a really great customization from this custom easel maker from down in Florida. And that way, like I can, you know, move it um, left to right anywhere on the easel so that my hand's not uh, rubbing up against the paint. OK. And, and what's your what's your typical studio practice like when you're working? Usually like I paint uh, eight to ten hours a day, uh, six days a week. And I'm listening uh, to podcasts, music, lectures while I'm painting, and um, just you know, you know, focusing on my work. I have to make sure to take breaks uh, to, to stretch, and so I don't get uh, cramped up. Um, but uh, yeah, I have lots of natural light as as well, which which is a, a benefit with uh, uh, skylights and um, sunroom windows. Okay. And, and as far as uh, studio location goes, you mentioned this earlier in 2010, 
Um, you opened your own studio gallery uh, located in Old Stony Creek, which is, is that like a, is that a, an historic area? Yeah, yeah. It's actually down the street from where the War of 1812 was fought. Oh, wow. Um, okay. Many years ago. Yeah, the Americans against the Canadians, uh, <laughs> uh, a war you probably want to remember. But um, <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, yeah, it's, um, so it's a quaint area. And, uh, you know, sometimes I, I think, you know, it'd be nice to live in, in New York or LA where a lot of art is going on, but I, I do like the the quiet town and um, keeps me really grounded as well. So, so Studio Gallery would suggest that you're both working there as your main studio, but also showing there. And I think you mentioned that earlier that you do shows there. I mean, at least when things are not locked, locked down. Um, so how did that all first come about? Uh, how did you get the idea of opening your own space to show your work? Yeah, so in, in 2010, um, people... Were, a lot of people were coming to my studio to, to see my work and thought it would make sense to open it up to the public. And it has a, it's attached to my house, but has a separate entrance. And someone suggested that I have um, like an exhibition opening, an open house uh, around Christmas time. And so that started in 2010. And um, every year since then, I've, I've done one. And that's just a chance. Um, for primarily like local collectors um, to be able to see my work, um, especially now that a lot of my work is down in the States. Um, I like to still give my my Canadian collectors uh, a chance to see what I'm doing. And and also like young budding artists who come and, and um, share their work with me and I uh, try to encourage them. But uh, I'm located on a major highway that is about halfway between the QEW, uh, between Niagara Falls and Toronto. And so um, I get, you know, uh, uh, American tourists um, coming up from, you know, Buffalo, New York, and also uh, people coming from Toronto. I, I have uh, highway attraction signs that uh, direct people there. And so, yeah, it's, it's worked for me. Um, I, I like talking to people uh, about my work and, uh, you know, I still have a lot of time to, to myself painting, but um, I, I do enjoy um, doing that. And uh, going forward in the future, um, I'm doing kind of like collector preview nights where, you know, my group of, of collectors get to see the, the new work. And so, uh, yeah, and and if I release, like I, I uh, released a, a book of my art uh, a few years ago and uh, had a book signing there. So yeah, it's it's just nice to have a space for like pop up exhibitions outside of special events and and you know collector uh, preview nights and stuff like that. Do you have just general opening hours like that? It's just people can just walk in and I mean when it's not uh, pandemic times, do, do people do people just drop by? Yeah, yeah, I'm currently closed right now, but generally i'm open uh tuesday to saturday from 1 to 5 p.m do you find it d- distracting at all like uh, like while you're trying to work and focus and, and people come in and get you out of that headspace uh maybe sometimes but most people are usually um pretty uh re- respectable and uh they you know look at the work there's there's lots of prints to to flip through and uh my painting stories to to read on the wall but um there yeah most people are pretty consider it, I would say. <laughs> Very cool. Um, so, so shifting gears a little bit, um, and you mentioned this earlier as, as far as the reasoning behind how you landed in uh, Canada and didn't continue to move around was because, you know, your family contracted uh, chronic Lyme disease, which, you know, to be honest, I didn't know Lyme disease could be chronic. I, I thought it was more of, more of like a bacterial infection that, that you just treated and, and sort of went away. Uh, so, you know, when were you all diagnosed with that and, and what has that impact been on you? Yeah, so my dad was first diagnosed in 2008 and then um, you know, the rest of uh, the family uh, in the following years. And so the thing is, it, it is generally acute Lyme disease. If you um, catch the, the tick and know that you've been bitten and you get the flu-like symptoms or bullseye rash, you can get a round of antibiotics um, for a month and uh, it's, it's generally uh, out of your system. But the problem was that it got missed um, in my, my family's case. Uh, it took 18 specialists before we finally oh, wow. found someone um, who uh, was, was Lyme literate. And so if it gets missed, um, the Lyme bacteria um, gets deep within your 
uh, soft tissues and uh, throughout your uh, whole circulation. And so um, it attacks kind of uh, the weakest areas in, in your body. And it's actually a disease that's caused by an imbalance in the ecosystem. Um, there's, you know, too many ticks and um, not enough, you know, uh, other kind of animals to limit those tick populations. Um, and so it's it's definitely like really on the rise. And now some um, notable celebrities, um, you know, like Justin Bieber and uh, Shania Twain have um, uh, fallen ill with uh, Lyme. And um, fortunately, um, my family was able to get treatment for it uh, several years ago, which, which helped us. And um, we're on a very uh, strict diet and uh, regimen of supplements. And the, one of the ways it's affected me is, is not just like, uh, you know, cognitively having brain fog and um, poor memory, but also just in uh, toxic sensitivities. Um, so with my studio practice, I had to really change the, the materials that I was using I went away from using all kind of cadmium paints, any solvents, um, just to try to paint uh, with as clean, uh, healthy, non-toxic materials as possible, um, which has helped. Yeah, I read that that you were transitioning to a, a quote-unquote non-toxic studio. So have you completed that transition or is it still something you're trying to move towards? Yeah, it's still a, a work in progress. Like I didn't want to throw out all of my... <laughs> Uh, paid that that I had. Um, but uh, yeah, I found various companies and read uh, different books. There's a book called Artist Beware. And uh, that one has a lot of helpful information. And one, one really helpful product was um, a solvent alternative called EcoSolve, which is from Natural Earth Pigments out in Portland. And, um, you know, it's a great brush cleaner. And, uh, you know, and then I just use walnut oil. And so that's uh, all, all natural. And then stay away from heavy metal pigments. And then I also wear gloves um, just to be safe, too. Have you noticed any differences in the non-toxic materials and how they react to other things to, to effectively change the way that you paint? Um, it hasn't changed a whole lot. Um, there's sometimes convenience, I would say, with with more um, toxic paints. I, I have gotten into, you know, natural pigments um, as well for uh, colors that are hard to find um, non-toxic. But generally, it hasn't been too bad of a, a transition, I, I would say. But like, I wouldn't, like, I think a lot of artists could make the, the switch. But because I have kind of these sensitivities to, to toxins, it affects me more so than the, the average healthy person. Like I can tell like if I'm breathing in something toxic, um, I'll get a runny nose, I'll get sneezing, a sore throat. And so uh, just just for, for, for my health, um, it, it's worth it. Uh, maybe I won't have all the same paints um, as usual, but I'm just impressed actually how many brands um, are switching over to like cadmium free, um, you know, orange and red and yellow like Utrecht and and others and so I you really see a transition happening um, pretty broadly in the community okay that's great um, and, and so you know one of the aspects of Lyme disease from what I understand is an amido deficiency um, which puts you in incredible risk as far as like covid 19 and the current you know state of the world so how are you guys as a family you know protecting yourselves because you are in this high risk category mm -hmm. yeah we're trying to be as um, careful as possible fortunately um, I'm home based with with my business and so don't have to, to go out uh, very often we've had friends who have been very gracious you know, our church friends have gone us groceries and uh, We've just limited our exposure going going outside, uh, which is which has been hard because you know I'm very thankful for all those on the front line who, um, you know, are uh, giving up their their lives for for others. And uh, we have uh, several family members um, who are working uh, in the in the medical field and psychotherapy, essential services, and so it, it is uh, somewhat hard to kind of feel like we're a bit on the on the sidelines. Um, but yeah, we've just been trying to do, do our best and in order to yeah, be as, be as careful as possible. 
Um, so you mentioned earlier that the last, or I guess the first piece in your new series is going to be a part of a show at Ray's Contemporary Gallery, which I believe was originally scheduled for May, but uh, is there a new date decided on that? Yeah, I believe it's going to be um, for October now. Okay. And so it's a uh, group show that spun off um, from an award that I received for the Art Renewal Center. And so um, Ray's Contemporary Gallery, they were um, you know, one of the galleries that gave out awards. And so uh, this has uh, all come together. It's going to be um, supporting the American Bird Conservancy. So it's all based around birds, the, the exhibition. And so, uh, yeah, I had a, a painting uh, finished and was uh, about to send it off for, for the show this May, but um, it was, of course, uh, uh, rescheduled. And, um, you know, New, New York is, I, I, I feel bad for all that's going on um, there. They've been hit hard. Um, but, uh, yeah, fortunately, fortunately, it's going to be um, rescheduled for, for the fall, and I'm going to have time to do uh, another painting. Okay, so you're gonna have you're gonna have two in that in that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very cool. Any anything else that you have coming up that you'd like to share? New new uh, in addition to the the new series. Yeah, I I just heard news the other day that I have uh, a painting that's been selected into a, a museum show um, for the Society of Animal Artists, and so um, I'm the youngest member in, in that guild, and uh, very fortunate to have work accepted. It's going to be at the the Hiram. Lovelt Art Museum in uh, New Jersey, and that's going to be in the fall. Okay, awesome. Awesome. So got a lot of good stuff coming up. Uh, where can people find you online? They can check out my website, um, joshteason.com and spelled T-I-E-S-S-E-N. And um, my name as well for Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. So would happy would be happy to connect with anyone. Very cool. Well, one last question, and this is something that I that I like to ask everybody: uh, Who is one artist that you'd like to see me have on the show? Oh, this is a hard question, and I've heard your uh, podcast before, so I was um, prepared. Uh, you know, there's so so many, and um, it's hard because I don't want to offend anyone. Um, so many talented artists out there, but uh, a friend of mine whose work I I really admire is, is Martin Whitfoot. Oh, and nice. uh, yeah, I don't know if uh, you've had him in, in mind. He's just, uh, you know, very uh, well known, obviously, in the new contemporary um, kind of world of, of art. And yeah, I just love, you know, the meaning that he infuses in his work. And he's constantly um, pushing the boundaries. And uh, yeah, there's kind of a, a family connection uh, to him because um, my really? my uncle actually um, was his roommate in art school. Really, really. So, so you, so you know him? Have, have you guys met? Uh, not in person, just just over email. But um, hope to get the chance someday. Awesome, very cool. Well, Josh, it was great talking to you, man. I really appreciate you coming on the show today. Yeah, and just thanks so much, Michael, for for doing this. It's so cool to get a, a personal behind the scenes look at the artists that we love. So that's it for this episode of Art Affairs. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Josh. One of the things that impressed me the most about my chat with him was despite the fact that he is so talented and had his talent recognized incredibly early, it doesn't seem like that ever got to his head. And what he said about not wanting to ride on that prodigy label and letting the quality of his work really speak for itself uh, was something I respected a lot. Uh, because that is the risk a lot of times with, with having a lot of success at a really young age is getting too caught up in the labels that can come with it and then struggling to establish something for the long term. Uh, Josh definitely seems to have taken the more humble road, and I think it's resulted in him starting out on a really good foot. It'll definitely be interesting to see how his career progresses from here. So thanks again to Josh for joining me today, and thank you for checking out the show. I'm truly grateful for your support. Feel free to shoot me an email if you have any suggestions for the show, or if there's a guest you want me to try and have on. I'd love to hear any feedback you might have for me. You can contact me through my website at artaffairspodcast.com. And like I said at the front of the show, you can go there to check out any previous episodes. You can also find the show on Instagram and Facebook at Art Affairs Podcast. 
And last but not least, if you're on Apple Podcasts, I'd be super grateful if you took a moment to write a review for the show. It just takes a moment, and it helps out a ton. So until next time, be good to yourself, and be good to each other. Thank you.